Hi, Heather. Hey, Mike. How are you doing? Fine. And yourself? I'm doing good. Thank you. So anything new going on? Well, let's see. Um, so the last live stream was Leap Day, right? And, yes. And um, I haven't done anything really huge. There was a table game show here in Vegas where if I may toot my own horn, I was awarded the Lifetime Achievement <laughs> Award. Woo! Congratulations. Um, That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And just little day hikes. Uh, nothing, yeah, no trips, nothing really huge. Um, but um, yeah, I would say that starting with the eclipse trip for April 8th is going to kind of start my busy travel season. Oh, that's so exciting. So yeah. what, what does your uh, travel season include? So let's see, there's the eclipse right after that. I'm going to do go to page Arizona to kayak horseshoe bend and antelope Canyon. Um, Let's see what else we got here. Oh, it's, I'm going on a three-day ski trip tomorrow. Oh, wow. Um, that sounds and really good. Let's see here. Um, I'm going to Washington and hopefully Alaska in July. I'm going to um, have, a, to have a soup by waterfall in Arizona in the Grand Canyon in June. And um, I was doing a week in Santa Barbara. And then there's going to be another Grand Canyon trip in October and a Catalina trip in November. So that's what wow. that's on the calendar so far. But there's other things percolating that are still in the kind of the talking about phase. That's incredible. That is so cool that you get to do all that. Well, I wish I could do more. <laughs> what is the one thing you haven't done yet that you really wish you could do? Oh, there's there's a lot of things. Number one on the list. Um, I guess one thing that is really, really pulling me really hard is to do the John Muir Trail. Um, oh, okay. In the Sierras. Um, yeah. Um, why do you, why are you looking forward to that one? You know, I've just done parts of it here and there, and it's just really beautiful. And it's this, just this really epic challenge that's kind of right here in my own backyard. And, um, um, but, but somehow it just evades me. This is the kind of thing that you need support to do because it, it's, it's about 220 miles. So it's difficult to take that much food with you backpacking. So most people get, re, have a friend to resupply them at, at um, certain places along the way where it cross, where it comes near a road, but I have yet to find anyone to help with that. Um, but, um, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of hoping that some kind of group will come along to, to, to do this and invite me, but so far it just hasn't happened. I may have to take the initiative and, and do it myself. Um, but, but it seems like none of my friends are really called to do this as much as I feel so, but anyway. Okay. Um, do you have any uh, trivia for us today? We do. In honor of Easter coming up um, on March 31st this year, we're going to do Easter trivia this week, today. Oh, fun. So let's get that started now, shall we? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So what question number one, what was the um, name of the feast that was being celebrated at the time of Jesus's crucifixion. Okay, so if you guys know the answer to that question, put it in the chat and we will get to it here as soon as we answer a few gambling questions. Uh, the, first, <laughs> the first gambling question I have for you is from Mark Alexander, who says, love your YouTube show. Uh, the history of the suits was interesting and I thought you could share it with everyone. Do you know the history of the suits? <clears throat> So I looked into this just right before the show, and um, I think that they're a carryover from the tarot deck where um, um, hearts um, carried over from the cups in the tarot deck, and those represent um, love and emotions. The diamonds somehow are associated with the coins in the tarot deck, which represent wealth and material things, and the spades, 
um, is associated with swords, which obviously represents um, um, like life's trials and um, and clubs somehow is associated with wands, which sim symbolizes growth and creativity. So on short notice, that, that's about as far as I can take that one. But if anyone else knows more than I do, feel free to um, chime in, in in the comments. So I'm sure this is wrong, but I always thought where the origination, uh, the origination story of the suit was, um, you fell in, you fell in love, and you got married, and that was hearts. And then the woman got all of the wealth of the guy, so that was diamonds. And then the guy pissed the woman off, so she like killed him and buried him with a spade. And then she was lucky; that was the club because the cops never came and threw her in jail, so she got away with it. Well, <laughs> that, that's a good <laughs> memory device, but I don't think <laughs> the, legend, the, the real story. No, I'm sure it's not the real story. I just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's go to our viewer questions and see what questions we have today. Our first question comes from Jean, who says, "Today is World Poetry Day. What are your what are some of your favorite poems?" My favorite poem begins with, "There was an old man from Nantucket," and I can't take it any further than that because it's <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But but to be perfectly honest with you, um, while I'm pretty good with math and things that involve cold memorization, I might not. I'm not. I don't know. I, I'm I'm not very good with creative things like poetry. So. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I, I can't give you a good serious answer to your question, to be perfectly honest with you. Okay. I usually read a lot of music lyrics in a kind of poetic manner, and I love a good discussion about what music lyrics mean. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not one to, you know, have a long list of favorite poets, shall we say. Okay. Um, I think my favorite poetry was uh, something I read when I was a child, a book called Where the Sidewalk Ends. I remember really enjoying that book. Is that by Sven Silverstein, whatever his name is? That sounds about right. Yeah. What did you say the name was? Where the Sidewalk Ends? Where the Sidewalk Ends. I remember that being like really enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Shel Silverstein. Um, that was a good memory. Yeah, he also wrote one of my favorite books, um, The Giving Tree. Oh, I don't know cool. if he wrote it or if he was the illustrator, but um, yeah, I think that I read most of his stuff as a kid. But I, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't, I don't remember the plot of that story, but I'm, it rings a bell and I'm sure I read it some 50 years ago. <laughs> Um, life, life pro has a good poem. Uh, roses are red, violets are blue. Gambling is fun, but wins are few. <laughs> I like that. That's good. If you guys have a favorite poem, uh, go ahead and put that in the chat so we could see, uh, what other poems people like. Uh, Debricks, Dalbrickson says math poem big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them little fleas have littler fleas so to add infinitum i think it's pronounced ad infinitum um, oh thank you for uh <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay yeah thank you for sharing that i don't have any good comments about it okay um do you want to do one more question or see if anyone got the trivia Let's see if anyone got the trivia. Sounds good. So is the answer a uh, Passover? Yes, it is. Give Jean a point. Ooh. Okay, question Congrats. number two. What was the name of the animal that, or shall I, what was the type of animal that Jesus rode when he entered Jerusalem? And for extra credit, why? So if you guys know the answer to that, put that in the chat. 
Our next question comes from Life Pro, who asks, uh, can the game of craps ever be beaten mathematically, not just short-term system play, but with the same uh, perpetuated edge the casino holds over the player? No. Just simple answer, no. You cannot beat craps over the long term. Um, that's the point of the house edge, right? Yep. So if you guys have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat and we can uh, get to that in the order it is received. Uh, next question is from Northern Jim, who says, in the Wall Street Journal for March Madness, they suggest to pick the most likely least popular national champion. So that would be Auburn or Houston, not UConn. Any thoughts? Hmm. I would really, I would need to see the context of the article. Um, I will say that for betting purposes, if you must just have a simple strategy, it is better to pick to, to bet on underdogs. And it's also better in general to just pick more unknown teams um, as opposed to ones like, like, like UConn or say Alabama that have a huge following. So that's about as far as I can take that one. Okay. Um, so the next one is not a question, but a poem uh, from Northern Jim. My favorite poem was from J.W. Curry. The poem is just the letter I with his thumb fingerprint used instead of a dot. I like that. Our next question comes from Paul, who says, could you please do an in-depth article or video on how historical horse racing machines really work? There's so little info out there. Um, it's funny you mention this because I was just talk I was just trying to explain this to somebody yesterday. And I have been tasked with designing um, horse racing games like Derby. And the way I do it, and the way I think that all of them do it, is you give each horse a particular weighting. And um, when you determine which horse comes first, it's their probability of finishing first is in proportional to their weighting. And then after you choose that winner, then you look at all the remaining horses and you choose one of those to come in second place, and again, proportional to their weighting, and so on, going as far down, you know, all the way down to the last place horse. And um, I, I know I, 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 read, I write about this somewhere, but I did it a long time ago. But um, the, the, the equations for this, given the weightings for, say, the probability of, of coming in, say, first, second, or third, as in a show bet, get, get rather complicated. Um, I personally do these calculations by computer, but that is how I do it, and I think that is the standard way of doing it. Okay. Our next question comes from Escott, who says, on nine-line pinball, what is the better bet? one line for a dollar and one shot or nine lines for ten dollars with five shots i don't know what game you're referring to sorry okay uh next up is northern gym can someone be successful at poker by using statistics or numbers only without trying to read the opponents yes absolutely i mean that's what uh, computer bots do and um Computers are very good at playing poker. So yes, absolutely. You know, it, it's like it, one line in Rounders, as much as I love the movie Rounders, one line I don't like is when Mike, the main character, says that poker is not about the cards, it's about the players. But I've always been a very mathematical poker player, and I tend to put math first um, and, and psychology second. Um, but it, you know, it's definitely a combination, but absolutely you can be a successful poker player, um, just using numbers and, um, probability. Okay. 
And remember, if you guys have any questions, put them in the chat and we will get to them in the order that it was received. Are you ready to do the trivia answer? Yes. What do we got? Okay. Now, in regarding a donkey, is it an ass? Yes, a donkey and an ass are the same thing. I just as didn't well want YouTube to like. Yep, yeah, so, I just yep, didn't YouTube enough. want YouTube to like penalize us for that. <laughs> no, I think that's fine. Um, much like I can say "bitch" because that is the correct term for a female <laughs> dog. Um, it depends yes. on context. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, um, that's that's a perfectly valid answer. Uh, did anyone know the reason why he rode a donkey? Uh, was it because the donkey um, th of the palms was thrown by the crowd? Well, that's the answer to what was going to be my next question. But, uh, oh. Um, um, but no. Um, and anything else about the reason why? No, uh, that was it. Okay. All right. No, it's it's because at that time that the king would ride a horse during time of war and he would ride a donkey during time of peace. So, um, so that's why Jesus chose to ride a donkey because he was trying to convey that he was um, conveying that, that he was coming in peace. So there you go. So my next question is going to be, what did the crowds put before the path that Jesus took um, as he went through Jerusalem, but Northern Jim already correctly stated that they threw palm fronds as well as garments. So let's just skip that one and go to um, how many times did Peter betray Jesus? Okay, so if you guys know the answer to that, put that in the chat. While we're waiting, our next gambling question comes from Mark Smith, who says... In Dragon Link, the rules state that an increase in wager increases your chances of winning the major, minor, and grand jackpots. Is this done by more of those balls being added to the bonus round mix? Um, let's see. Okay. Um... To be perfectly honest, I don't know exactly how they do it, but I, as a, a pretty significant part of my income comes from designing slot machines um, for companies that are too small to have their own mathematician. And I'm often tasked with making a game that has progressives where the progressives remain the same no matter how much you bet. And so, I all, so I always emphasize that if players bet more, they should be rewarded by having a greater chance of hitting that progressive. So the way I do it is, is just that, that the chance of hitting these progressives is proportional to how much you bet. And I'm quite sure that um, um, uh, I think it's aristocrat that makes Dragon Link, that they do the same thing. They may... Um, display it to the player in terms of, of more uh, balls or whatever. But, um, but, but exactly. I don't know. I'm not familiar with the game enough to tell you for sure. That's what's going on. So that is my okay. answer to that one. Okay. Our next question comes from uh, technics who says, does your method of handicapping the Super Bowl work for any other sports such as basketball or hockey? No, pretty much not because, um, you know, I have tried it with just regular season football games and I have found that my method really comes really close to what the actual spread and totals are. It's just the Super Bowl where it's off. And I think it's because the Super Bowl attracts a lot of um, square money and, and a lot of the square action is on the over, which, which tends to move the over underline higher. And, um, yeah, so, so I think that it is just taking advantage of, of, uh, crowd mentality and betting the opposite way. Okay. Our next question comes from Paul who says, are the RTP settings of a slot based on max bet only? Hmm. 
Yeah, I would I would say so. For um, for example, in the UK, they have to indicate the RT the the RTP of a slot machine, and you know I don't know exactly what goes into that calculation, but they probably want to make it look as high as possible, which is which if the RTP does go up as the bet as the bet goes up, then they probably do quote the maximum point. But in a lot a lot of slot machines, it doesn't make any difference what you bet. The RTP is is the same. So yeah, so that's my answer to that one. And sorry if I keep looking out here, but there's supposed to be a guy guy coming over to fix my refrigerator. Oh no, what happened and to your refrigerator? Has, it's leaking, but uh, anyway, I don't see him yet. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, I got a question about the RTP. Okay. Um, does the gaming control board require that it be a certain level or a certain number, or can the casinos just pick whatever they want? They just choose to pick the numbers that they do because it's better for them. It has to be at least 75%. Okay. Okay, so our next question, or do you want to do a trivia answer? Let's, let's do the trivia answer. Okay. So for the trivia answer, is it uh, three times? Yes, it is. It indeed, three times. Woo. Yep. Congrats. So I, I see if some of you got that, so good job. Okay, so the next question is, how much was Judas paid to betray Jesus? Okay, so if you know the answer to that, put it in the chat. While we are waiting, our next gambling question comes from Good Sir. Hello, is it possible to make a finite deck basic strategy for blackjack in Excel? Could you advise any literature on that? And by the way, your infinite deck video is great. Maybe this could be slightly modified. Thank you. Well, thank you for the compliment. And yeah, the answer is basically no. Um, it, it gets really difficult calc uh, analyzing blackjack with a finite number of decks. And Excel is just not the kind of tool that can do it. So I do have a whole nother video where I show how to program um, blackjack with a finite number of decks. So if you understand coding, I would refer you to that video. But yeah, again, short answer is no. Excel is not the appropriate tool for that. Okay. And when they are looking on YouTube uh, for that video, do you remember the, the title of that video that they could search? Uh, let's see. Um, so I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm just going to type in my name and that leads you to my, the odds must be crazy channel videos. And, um, I'm just going to put in the search bar blackjack and but, but okay, now I'm getting just general blackjack videos, not necessarily mine. Um, if you go to your channel, okay, it has here a we go. Okay. It's, it's called How to Code Blackjack in C. And I'm surprised to see it has 4,200 views. Um, 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 yeah, to be honest, I thought that one was, would be something nobody would ever watch. But um, so I just did it kind of to prove to people that blackjack, that the basic strategy is right, that the odds are right. Some people say that um, they don't believe in the basic strategy because whatever reasons why. So I have spent made countless videos to prove only Ed Thorpe um, calculated the odds for blackjack and everybody Every blackjack expert since then is just quoting him like like parrots. No, you know, I except in rare cases, I do all my own math. <laughs> nice. Now, isn't that funny when you put up a YouTube video and you think nobody's going to watch it and ends up getting like the most views? Yeah, it's really surprising to me um, what people will watch 
like um like you know let's let's see here um um i wonder if i can sort these in terms of popularity order you can uh, you can uh Okay, so Click wow, views. my How to P Play Crafts video has 610,000 views. Woo. Everything with Angela just has views in the hundreds of thousands. She's um, the best. My She's so two amazing. Two Rubik, yeah, my 2x2 two two Rubik's Cube video, that is 162,000. Wow, this kind of makes my day. Um, <laughs> That's um, awesome. Yeah, I normally don't. I'm normally not a slave to statistics like this. I just make a video about what I find interesting and um, and just put it out there and see what happens. Um, yeah, maybe I should make more videos. Um, <laughs> okay, but let's see. Let's try to find some good videos that I think don't get enough attention. Um, was that the craps video that was the old craps video or was that the newer one that um like it was me you angela um i was the one that we shot at um aaron hightower's house okay cool out. yeah that was so weird <laughs> um yeah the videos that i make at these gaming shows tend to not do very well hmm. um and um, let's see what my worst performing video is. Yeah. You're going to have to scroll through a lot of videos. Okay. Anyway, I've spent enough time on that. Why don't we get back? <laughs> okay. You want to see if we have an answer to the trivia question? Yes. Okay. Is it a uh, 30 silver? Yes, 30 pieces of silver. Very good, Dalbrick Dalbrickson. So the next Easter question is, how did Judas identify to the soldiers who was Jesus? Okay, so if you guys know the answer to that, put that in the chat. Our next one is a statement. Uh, Gene says that he agrees that his favorite is the give, giving tree. So that was a very nice selection. Um, our next question comes from Northern Jim. What gives better perks at Bakra? Betting a black chip and doing more hands per hour or betting a purple at a busy or slow table? I would think probably the purple at the slow table. Um, it seems like high level Baccarat players that I know um, like to slow play it, um, like maybe only making a bet one hand out of every, uh, it really depends on the person, but basically skipping a lot of hands and, um, um, yeah, so that, that, I don't know what else to say, but yeah, I think, I think that it's better to make a small number of big bets than a large number of small bets. Right. So when they're giving you um, the points or whatever, when you're playing, it's based off of how much the bet is and how long you're at the table. Yeah. Now a good um, supervisor should depress the average bet uh, according to how many, basically counting no bet as a bet of zero. But, um, but good players tend to know which supervisors estimate generously and often helps to tip to to get those good estimates so yeah but that's about as far as i can take that one um i have a little more to add it also depends on if you're in like a high limit room with uh one floor supervisor watching one table versus let's say a busy pit where the floor supervisor is watching eight tables mm -hmm. uh, that would have that would have some um weight to it yeah and for lower level players i've noticed that lots of times they put for your average bet, whatever the first bet is. Yeah. Um, so that might be a good one to kind of, um, a good one to make a big wager on. Okay. So our next question comes from uh, Northern Jim, who says, the bonus for seven card straight flush at Pygal Poker is 8,000 to one. What are the real odds? 
This is big money, but it seems low in terms of the likelihood of this happening. Well, again, this is on my website. Um, let's just go to um, the list of games. Then click Pi Out Poker. And then we click on side bets, if I can find that. Let's do a search on side bets. Hmm. Okay, so it's down at the bottom under internal links. And then I click on Fortune Pygo Poker. And um, yeah, so the probability, so there's, the probability is okay. What did he? What event did he ask about? Um, a seven uh, flush. Okay. Right, which is okay. eight thousand to one. Okay. Well, and, it's actually, only a natural seven card straight flush pays the eight thousand, and that has a probability of one hundred and fifty-four million one hundred and forty-three thousand eight hundred. It's the number of, com of total combinations divided by 32. So that has a probability of 1 in 4.8 million. So you're only getting 8,000. So it really, there's not very much value in that at, at all because it's so difficult to hit. Yeah. Do they do that a lot with games? Yeah. Um, they're often really pretty stingy for for things like that that are really difficult to get. I mean, they could bump up the the win significantly at hardly any cost to the return to the RTP. And when I suggest that um, that game makers do this, they they always say that casinos hate paying big jackpots. And um, and if and if the game hits a big jackpot like shortly after it's released, they will get really nervous that maybe the math was wrong. So, um, you know, the, the gaming business in general is very risk averse and, and they don't like gambling. So, um, yeah. So, but I've always it, thought that the wins should be commensurate with the probability of, of, of winning. And isn't that pretty ironic that that's the case? Yeah, it, it is. It's very, it's very ironic. Now, uh, taking Pi Gal Poker as an example, um, you said it was what, 4.3 million? I don't even remember, but go on. Um, so if they're, if the dealer is dealing 60 hands per hour on Pi Gal Poker uh, and there's 24 hours in the uh, day, that would probably be what, one seven card straight flush hitting every couple years or something? Okay, well, I see I still have 4.8 million in my calculator here. So how many hands per hour? 60 hands per hour. Okay, and let's divide 24 for 24 hours a day and then 365 days in a year. So that should hit once in every nine years. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> uh, cool. Okay, so our next question is from Technics. Are all of your plans set for the eclipse? Pretty much. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, um, Yep, have, I, I booked the flight and the lodging a long time ago, and um, and I was practicing taking some pictures of the sun just the other day, and I have a big old heavy uh, the um, telephoto lens that's like two feet long, and it was too heavy for my flimsy tripod, so I ordered a more sturdy one. So I'm waiting for that on Amazon. Um, so I might want to do a little bit more practice photography before the big day, but, but otherwise, um, everything is, is all set. Nice. Um, if your tripod, if you still have tr trouble with your tripod, another thing you could do is actually attach a weight to the, uh, bottom portion of the tripod and that helps make it, uh, more sturdy. Well, the, the problem is that the lens is very heavy. So you have this camera and then a big, huge, heavy lens hanging off of it. Um, and um, so let's say the sun is like at a 45 degree angle. The, the little like 
thing that's like this in the tripod has to be able to support all that weight. And mine just doesn't. It, it just, the gravity just pulls it down. So that you need sense. to be able to, you know, point the, the, the camera to wherever the sun is and, and, and have it just stay there. But, um, but, you, but, you know, you need, you, for a really heavy lens, you need a good quality tripod which um, I don't have. You know, the one I have now is fine for just a camera, but not a big heavy lens attached to it. Do you use any filters uh, specifically for this? Yes. Um, for the 2017 Eclipse, I, um, I brought a, um, the solar filter from my telescope which was very flimsy and in the process of transporting it, it got damaged. It was basically just like a piece of tin foil. And um, I tried to repair it with pieces with like the, the, the um, lens part of eclipse glasses. And I just taped them, which worked okay. Um, but it still distorted the pictures somewhat. Mm -hmm. So I recently bought like a hundred dollar good quality, um solar filter to attach to the to, to the lens which um so far has, has done an outstanding job and it stays on and it's it's sturdier so i think that i'm going to come back with much better eclipse pictures this time my 2017 ones were very disappointing are you going to show these pictures if they end up turning out good uh on the next live stream oh of course um good um, absolutely. Even if they turn out bad, I'll, I'll still share them. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Should we see if we have an answer to the trivia question? Yes. Okay. Is it, is it a kiss? Yes, absolutely. Um, Dalbrick gets a point for that. And, uh, Ooh. yeah, so the story goes is in, um, so Judas was paid the 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. But basically the high priest asked him, how will we know which one Jesus actually is? And, um, um, and so, so Judas said, I will identify him by kissing him, which he did. He said something like, you know, good morning, rabbi, and kissed him. And, and then they, they, they arrested Jesus. As the story goes... Okay, next question. Um, so after all the events of, um, so af after Judas betrayed Jesus, he, he felt very remorseful about it. And he tried to return the money to the high priests. Um, and, the, in, in, and the high priest initially didn't want the money back because it was blood money, but, um, but, Judas insisted. So um, they used the money to buy what? That is the next question. Okay. So if you guys know the answer to this, put it in the chat. While we are waiting, our next gambling question comes from Life Pro, who says, Sorry for repeating this uh, craps topic, but if someone really did find a way to hold the advantage in craps over the house for a long term, uh, mathematically proven, what would that be worth? It's really a ridiculous question. It's like asking, what would a perpetual motion machine be worth? Uh, or um, Because it's impossible. You know, not only can't bending systems defeat the house advantage, they can't even dent it. Um, but to make it a more practical question, let's say that I had some kind of way. Okay, for example, there was, I think, a Stephen King story where somebody had like really good powers of hypnotism where he could make people think they were seeing whatever he wanted to, he wanted them to think. So what if I had the ability to make, okay, now let's rephrase it in a more simple way. Let's just say that I had some kind of supernatural ability to make, the dice land however I wanted, but let's say that I only had, um, say, a 10% effectiveness rate, the other 90% of the time, it was still random. I assure you that even with 10%, I would have a very strong advantage. 
Um, so something like that would be worth millions and millions of dollars. Um, uh, but I don't know, like something like 50, 100 million, something like that. Just to I would throw pay, out a number. I would pay 50, 100 million for a unicorn. Yeah. Um, did, did you, speaking of the Bible, did you know unicorns are mentioned and existed in biblical times? No, I didn't know that. Yep, it's not just a, um, yeah, so there's there's biblical support for unicorns. <laughs> Fantastic. I don't get what the big deal is, though, about unicorns. Can you explain it to me? Like, why do you see um, so many girls with unicorn backpacks and things like that? Probably the Lisa Frank fad that happened in the 90s. Uh, that's probably the big reason. I know that having a horn on top of a horse uh, that could slaughter anyone in the matter of seconds while being very majestic sounds good to me. I didn't think the horn was meant for um, attacking reasons. I thought it was more ornamental. Um, I think in fantasy books, it's uh, magical, like a wand. Okay. Okay, but did they ever impale their enemies with their the, the horn? It depends on what story you're reading. Hmm, okay. Okay, true or false? Unicorns have wings. That's a Pegasus. Right, false. It's because Pegasus was a particular winged horse, uh, but I forgot the general term for them. And if you have a Pegasus with a horn, that just means you had a unicorn for the mother and a Pegasus for the father. I see. <laughs> All right, enough about that. The look on your face was priceless. I'm not good at okay. telling when people are joking and being sarcastic. <laughs> Our next question comes from Technics. Uh, what do you know about chipless smart pit uh, electronic table games by Interblock Gaming? Do they have individual dealers and standard card shoes? And can I still count cards at these tables? To be honest, I, I don't know anything about this particular brand and how they shuffle. Um, You know, well, I, I would trust that the cards are fairly shuffled. Um, maybe you're asking is is maybe they, yeah, to be honest, I, 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 I just don't know. First off, if you want to see this kind of stuff, go to G2E because they have that kind of thing mm -hmm. all over G2E. Second of all, um, the chipless smart pit electronic table is just for the chips. It's like an RIFD or F, what was it? RFID uh, system. And so it's basically your bedding, but without chips. So it doesn't have anything to do with the uh, the cards. Um, if you want to do like a, a shuffling machine, that would be something different. Um, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, um, I, I don't know enough about it. You know, techniques, if you want to expand on your question, you may. But, um, but, but Interblock is a a very sharp company and I don't think, I think it would be really unlikely that there would be some kind of a simple advantage to be gained from one of their products. Okay. So our next question comes from good sir, who says, do online casinos use loaded decks? For example, remove some of the face cards, um, et cetera. How is something like this controlled? No, absolutely. It would, um, in a, in a regulated environment like Nevada, they don't. They would the casino would get in so much trouble if they were caught, shall we say, like taking aces out of out of the shoe of blackjack. Uh, it, you know, it, it's it's just not worth it. You know, I, I could see, um, you know, some shady illegal casino doing that, but um, but but you know, the legitimate ones, the the legitimate casinos just do not do that. Okay. And um, regarding the online casinos, how do you know if they're regulated or not? They're basically not. Um, mm -hmm. um, if they're in, if they're out of, say, like one of the British Channel Islands or Malta, there is some legitimate regulation there. But, um, 
but still for the most part, they're pretty unregulated, you know, but even in an unregulated place like Costa Rica, I still think that um, they play a fair game because um, just because of the house edge, you know, it, it's, it's, it's so easy to make money as a casino. So you, you don't need to cheat to do really well. You know, as long as you have the players, um, you're going to make, you're going to make good money. So uh, why take any chances? That's Nevertheless, cheating has been caught with internet casinos, but, but none that involved live dealers. It was usually just rinky dink little ones. And, and I think that it's much safer than it used to be. Okay. Our next question comes from Source Keen, who says, on slots, is it better to increase your bet by betting more credits on the same denomination or betting the same number of credits on a higher denomination? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would, um, it really would depend on the, the particular game, but, but, but if forced, I would say it's better to bet a small number of credits on a high denomination than a high number on a low denomination. <clears throat> and it's because with sometimes, especially with the older games, the RTP did go up as the denomination went up, but not as the number of, of credits went up. But I tend to think that with the more modern games, uh, they're all the same, but I, I don't know for sure. And that is about as far as I can take that one. Okay. You want to see uh, the answers to the trivia questions? Yes. Okay. Was it a uh, plot of land? Yes, but what for full credit, I'll give you partial credit for that. What was the land used for? Let's see if anyone has that. Uh, was it used for Bitcoin? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um nope no other answers besides that one yes it was used by a potter's field which is um where they would bury um the bodies of, of beggars and just unclaimed bodies unknown bodies um things like that yeah burial land there you go okay our next uh trivia question is what is uh how about okay this is a tough one um so i guess it was a, a passover tra tradition to release a prisoner um um so um so pontius pilate had his hands on jesus and um he also already had another prisoner whose name I will not say. And Pilate asked the crowd, who do you want me to release, Jesus or this other person? So the question is, who is the person who actually did get released? So that's the origin story of the prisoner's dilemma then, right? I'm not, can you repeat your question? That's the origin story of the prisoner's dilemma? It's a joke. No. No, that's that's something that I could talk a long time about, but it's a unrelated yes. topic. <laughs> totally unrelated. OK, so while we're waiting for you guys to put the answer, the real answer to that trivia question in the chat, uh, our next gambling question comes from Ghost, who says on a seven by seven magic square numbered one through forty nine. How many possible squares are there that will always have columns, rows, diagonals? that add to the same number? Well, I, of course, I don't have an answer to that off the top of my head, but I remember in the 90s, I was very obsessed with magic squares. And um, so going back 30 years, I, I do know that there are mathematical techniques to make magic squares of any size. I don't remember them. But but how many possible ways can you make a seven by seven? Off the top of my head, I just frankly don't know. But you know, I'm sure that there's a lot. Um, but um, perhaps in the hundreds, maybe the low thousands. But yeah, that's about as far as 
I can take that one. But again, the short answer is I don't know, but there's at least one. Okay. Our next question comes from Northern Jim. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, S -T -S -T -S -T. S -T -S -T. Is it worth is it worth it to play a progressive when they become a positive EV or are the odds too great to even, even bother? Well, you have, everyone has to answer that question for themselves. For example, last year, the there was a, a progressive side bet in face-up pie-gow poker at the um, Caesars Casinos that had a very big player advantage, like 40%. And it was worth like $30 an hour just to play it. And that's even counting the expected loss from the base game. But the jackpot was was six point four million. So I think that, and you could expect if you weren't hitting that jackpot, you could expect to lose something like one hundred and twenty dollars an hour playing it. So for the person with a small bankroll, it wouldn't make sense to play it because you basically don't have a big enough bankroll for it. Um, you would you would have to do. Um, um, look at the Kelly criterion to find out what would be the optimal bet size for that, given your bankroll. And, um, and I, I, I think I asked and asked, didn't ask the wizard question on this, but, um, but it, as I concluded, I think you needed a bankroll of somewhere in the hundreds of thousands, maybe even the low millions for it to be an intelligent bet. Uh, like a bankroll growing kind of bet because the odds of hitting it were just so small that um, the average person just you know, cannot expect to hit that and should expect it to cost a lot of money. So yeah, basically it comes down to how big is the jackpot? What's the probability of hitting it and how much money you actually have? Um, because it, you know, you should, because players with small bankrolls shouldn't be chasing huge, huge long shots. Yeah. Um, our next one is more of a statement from Northern Gem. I always place the dollar bet for the dealer on that bonus, uh, the Pi Gao fortune bonus, just to see the face of the manager if they hit the 8,000 to 1 payout. Um, I, I just want to say real quick, we just did a video on my YouTube channel about this where uh, dealers actually have a max payout, like they have a max tokes toke rate. So depending on the casino, it could be percentage of the original bet or it could be a flat rate, but there is a max that the dealer hits and they're not allowed to take any more than that. And the reason why is because any tokes that are dropped for the dealer, any tips uh, is seen as lost money. Whereas if a player won a jackpot, the casino can expect the player to give that money back if they continue playing. So that's why they put a max tip on there. Okay. And I would also like to add that I think that if you really want to show your appreciation for the dealers, I would just give them the, give them the tip rather than betting it. 100%. Yes. I completely agree with that because then you could give them any amount you want. Yep. And, and that tip isn't getting grinded down by the house edge. Yep. Exactly. I love that. Um, our next one is from Seth Black, who says, I play a roulette app game called Roulette Royal. I play the same 18 numbers, and I only hit 20% of the time. Shouldn't it be at least 40%? Well, it should be way more than that. Assuming this is double zero roulette, you should be hitting 47.4% um, of the time. So it definitely sounds very fishy if you're only hitting 20%. Um, I would be interested to see some data backing this up um, um, because I'd love to, to prove casinos are cheating when they're caught. But again, I, need, I, I would need to see some evidence. So if this person wants to send you some evidence, what's the best way to uh, send it to you? Yeah, you can go to the, the contact field in, in Wizard of Odds and... Um, I think file it as a gambling question, or or I tend to be more approachable through my Wizard of Vegas forum. So send me a pro 
so post your question on the forum and and I would probably pay more attention to it that way. And that's wizardofvegas.com? Yeah. Cool. Uh, you guys says, hello, everyone. Just want to put that one out there. Uh, we'll do one more gambling question and then we'll go to the trivia answer. Uh, Northern Jim's, I think this is a question. Uh, Northern Jim says, I think that nine year frequency for the seven card straight flush would be divided by seven since they always distribute cards for seven players, unlike Ultimate Texas Hold'em or other poker or carnival games. Yeah, you're right. I, I think I did say that once every nine years per player. Per player. So if it's one player sitting at one table, it would be nine years. Yeah, that he would could expect to see see it happen once every nine years. Yeah, and if it's if it's uh, seven players, so a full table year round, twenty four seven, it would probably be one point something years. Yeah, so that we can divide nine by seven, and we get one point two eight years. And that actually sounds correct as far as uh, being a casino dealer. In my experience, those big jackpots would pay about every year or so. So that sounds about accurate. Um, okay, so let's see what the answer to that trivia question is. Is it uh, Barbarous? Yes, very good. It is Barbarous. Barbarous. Yes, yes. very good. Hope, hope, hopefully there wasn't any searching going on there. Barbarous. Okay, so the last, <laughs> the last um, Easter question will be, what did the inscription above Jesus say on the cross, and in which languages was it written? So if you guys know, put that in the chat. Um, our next one is uh, from N Monster, who says, where are you going to view the eclipse? Waco, Texas. Oh. And you probably don't know what the weather is going to be like. It's just one of those things where you're just hoping that it's clear skies. Yeah, we're still kind of outside of the weather window. Um, but let's have, let's just for kicks, let's, um, let's see what it's going to be like the next 10 days in Waco. Okay. Um, and then while you're doing that, let's see what the next question is. If you guys have any questions, uh, well, we're close to the end, so it looks like we'll just be able to answer these questions that are already up. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, a thought experiment a thought experiment question for you, Mike. If you were a greedy corporate uh, casino head, what would be a blackjack rule you would change for another advantage for the casino and the player would barely notice? Hmm. Yeah, so I assume that I've already done six to five and I want to be even more greedy. Um, you could always use Spanish decks. Um, you know, you would have to declare this somehow, but um, maybe I, I, I think you would probably need to actually change the name of the game. Maybe I would call it just Spanish Blackjack as opposed to Spanish 21. And, um, you know, uh, taking out the tens from the deck is very strong in the casino's favor. And, you know, I, when I lived in Baltimore, I played a lot of Spanish 21 in Atlantic City. And I don't think the players had any clue about these tens being removed. And if you told them, I don't think that they grasped how it affected the game. So I thought that was, so I thought Spanish 21 was very clever in, in removing those tens, as it's a very good way to disguise taking something away from the players that they don't realize. So that's probably what I would do just off the top of my head. And I, again, I know we just talked about it being illegal to remove aces from the deck, which is, which is why I said I would have to like change the name of the game to, shall we say, make it more kosher. Uh, are you still there, Heather? I don't know what you're seeing, but I just have, you're just frozen. And, um, hmm. Uh, 
So I think I lost Heather, but hopefully the show is still going on. So I'm looking at the comments and right. Absolutely. The sign said, um, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And, um, and, um, the languages were in Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. So, um, I see Heather just came back. I lost you for a minute there. Sorry uh, about that. I think my internet dropped. That's okay. Um, I was just kind of doing this. So I do see somebody ask, do you think there's any merit to moon phases affecting how the dice roll and crafts? Absolutely not. Um, you know, the moon does have some gravity, so maybe it would play an effect, but it doesn't, it's not going to like favor any particular role or the other. Um, so basically bottom line is, um, it, it doesn't matter. You know, the math is the same with or without the moon. Um, well, I see it's past four o'clock. Um, so yeah, why don't we, um, end the show on that note? Sounds good. And when is the next time we're going to be doing this? The next time will be April 18th. Awesome. So you can look forward, I hope. look forward to my report about the eclipse at that time. I hope you have fun. Thank you. So again, to all of you who don't know, total eclipse of the sun, April 8th. Um, in the United States, it's going to run from Texas all the way through Maine. It's going to run through many parts of Mexico, but you must be in that eclipse path, which is very narrow. It's only about 50 miles wide to have the moon completely block out the sun. So major cities that it's going to go through are San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, um, Buffalo, Cleveland, maybe Indianapolis. I don't remember the whole list, but I think Texas is going to be a really good choice for clear weather. And speaking of weather, let's see if, um, um, no, my weather for Waco still has not come up yet. Weather.com is so slow, but, um, yeah, that's where I'm going to see it. And hopefully I'll have clear skies. And, um, yep. So cool. thank you, Heather, for, um, everything and thank you audience for all your questions and participation and i will see y'all in three weeks always my pleasure i hope you have a great time and i'll see you in three weeks okay thank you bye everyone um, bye